Isn't it nice to have them lead us every Sunday? So let's give them a hand. Thank you all. Would, would you convey that, John, to all the folks who are backstage already? We really appreciate them. Thank you so much. I have two books to sell. Usually don't. In fact, I've never done this. But um, I think you'll enjoy. Steve Dowdle was our pastoral care pastor for years. We've got some of these left. And two things. It's a great counseling book if you're involved with helping people with problems. And the other thing is about half of you are in this book. And uh, <laughs> he's changed all the names. But uh, you might really enjoy reading about your fellow church members or yourself or using the principles to help others. Second one's a book that I wrote called uh, The Sound of God's Voice. It's been translated into Portuguese and Thai and Spanish. And um, it's, it's really basically what it's like to, to hear God's voice and some of the issues that you and I deal with in ministry and in the Christian life. And as Glenn said last week, they're both worth at least 100 each, but we're going to sell them for just $10. And uh, proceeds didn't go back to the church. The others go to preach it, teach it. So... I hope you'll find these helpful. They're uh, out at the uh, plaza as the service is over. Julie and I and the girls were by the beach feeding seagulls. It's fun to watch seagulls, how they fight and peck at each other, isn't it? And uh, go for the choice morsels. So Bronwyn was holding her hand up like this with little fish we brought and some bread and stuff. narrowed down that the reason geese honk is because there's those times when some of the geese just can't quite make it and they begin to fall behind. And so always at least one goose is, is uh, dispatched to fly alongside the trailing goose and they honk for encouragement. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Now if I could be a geese, I mean a goose or a seagull, I wouldn't be either one, frankly. But... Um, <laughs> kind of be better to flow along the way that the geese fly because they give great encouragement. Now, Glenn and I have been doing a little series on encouragement. Last Sunday, this Sunday, Glenn's got next Sunday to tie this all together. And I'd like to do this in the context of love. Because, of course, we all recognize that a lot of encouragement is what? Just loving, expressing itself. And so I want to put this in the context of divine agape love, which leads to tremendous encouragement for us as well as the folks who are around us. One of my favorite quotes about this that is really easy to uh, lock into is this, man doesn't live by bread alone. He needs buttering it up. Well, that's what we do with encouragement. We do a little buttering up because we all need it. Now, watch this. Love is always a verb. In this 1 Corinthians passage that we're all familiar with, uh, you may or may not realize that every one of these descriptive phrases is a verbal adjective. They are verbs because love is not a feeling as such. It has some feelings. But love's always a verb. Now, it's intriguing that when children give definitions for love, they always use verbs. Have you noticed? You can go on the Internet. You know, there's all kinds of fun, funny stuff little kids say. I came across uh, one at random. But I was intrigued that basically everyone talked about actions. Watch this. This is children's definitions. When my, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it all the time, even when his hands got arthritis. 
And that's love. See the action that the child observes? Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt, and then he wears it every day. All right? <laughs> I know that my older sister loves me because she gives me all of her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> Love is when mommy sees daddy sitting on the toilet and she doesn't think it's gross. Okay. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw one in for fun. There's not much verb there. All right, last one. You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. And it's good for them to get reminded. So all those are their verbs, their action things. But when you get to be an adolescent, listen to how adolescents describe love. It's usually in terms of a feeling. You know, I've got stars in my eyes. I've got tingles on my body. And all those are acceptable feelings. But most teenager descriptions of love have to do with feelings. We were at a youth camp in Prescott many years ago talking about love. And uh, one of the girls got up. I'll always remember her definition of love. She said, well, uh, love is kind of an inwardness-ish. See, she's trying to put feelings into words. Maybe love's more like an outwardness-ish. And she said, you know, I, I guess love is really an all over ish -ish -ish -ish. Now, 20 years later, follow her. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. She's sitting there with her first child, sitting in the, in the chair. Child has 104 fever. She's giving alcohol wipes, trying to get the fever down. And the child's diarrhea everywhere and vomiting everywhere. And you walk up to her and say, hey, you enjoying this? <laughs> Are you kidding? This is awful. And then you ask her, to define love. And here's what she'll do. She says, well, this is it. See, love is 2 o'clock in the morning, baby throwing up both ends, and you don't want to be there, but you're there because that's love. See, love is always a verb. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, if you've got your Bibles there, you can read along with me. There's that opening uh, uh, three verses of the preeminence of love. And then I want to Come to the knots of love. There's, there's several movements here. Look, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I have to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, But have not love, I gain nothing. Then you move into three movements. Watch this. First movement gives us the overall deep, deep, deep depth of love. He begins in verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Now, have you ever noticed the next movement contains eight knots? Here's what is not. And this is kind of the attitudes behind love. Verse 4. Love does not envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not self-seeking. It's not rude. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. The third movement moves to the positives, which, which flesh out those two beginning of love is kind, love and patient. And the third movement moves like this. Love rejoices with the truth. Always protects, <clears throat> always trusts. See, here's the verbs of love. It, it protects, it trusts, it always hopes, perseveres. And to kind of tidy it all up, Paul wrote, and love never fails. Put your name in there. It, it should be personified. I am patient. I am kind. I rejoice with the truth. I always protect. I always trust, I always hope, I always persevere. Love never fails. Now, a lot of us don't have any idea what some of those words really mean. Oh, you know, you get, what does it mean love always trusts? What does it mean always hopes? <clears throat> Let's kind of narrow this down <clears throat> under the context of encouragement, but understanding what love really looks like. We'll begin with love is patient. 
And I'll give you kind of a definition of this, because most of us think patient means looking at my clock, you know. When's my wife getting out here? We're going to be late. And patience means, oh, I don't care when she comes out and we're late. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's not looking at your clock. Patience is the ability to be wronged and wronged and wronged again and to have in your hands the power to retaliate but refuse to strike back. See, we're talking here about relationships with people when things go sour. Uh, Jesus taught this very clearly, of course, in Matthew uh, 5, 38 and 39. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. I had a friend in high school, his name was um, Hank. He was a high jumper at Baylor. Um, and one morning... I saw him at breakfast, and his face was just swollen. His eyes almost closed. He was just deep purple. And I mean, he, what happened to you? Well, what happened was one of the little freshman quarterbacks who was new to school thought he'd kind of show how tough he was, and he decided he'd pick out Hank, and he beat the living daylights out of Hank. And I said to him, why did you let him do that? He said, well, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. So I turned the other cheek. Uh, the little freshman quarterback was kicked out of school later that day. And I know the Bible talks about there are times when we've got to protect ourselves and protect others. But here's this young college guy trying to live out his faith. You know, Jesus never promised that if we had turned the other cheek, everything would go well, we wouldn't get hurt. What he's saying here is, put this in a deeper dimension. When we turn the other cheek, think about this, we look more like Jesus than we do at any other time. And it sets us apart as his followers. Love is patient, all right? When we're hurt, love is also kind. And what this kind of comes across is this. Patience says, I'll take anything from my enemies. Kindness says, I'll give anything to my enemies. Now, I put that in enemy terms because it's an enemy term. But what this means is I'm patient when others come against me. But I am kind, the word means useful, to others, whether it's an enemy or not. Real simple. How many of you have a nice meal at the restaurant and you leave a tip? Raise your hand. We all leave a tip, God willing. It's embarrassing to walk out without doing it. So we give a tip. How many of you give about 15% more or less? About 15%. Um, let's just say that the waitress or the waiter gives you very poor service. They're not around when you need them. You have to raise your hand and whistle and call their name to get their attention. You know, just awful service. How many of you would say, uh, I am tempted not to give them a good tip? Raise your hand. Well, I raised my hand there. We're all tempted that way. How many of you, you at one time or another have not given them a good tip? Thank you for your honesty. Your, boy, look at all those hands. What stingy congregation we have here. <laughs> Well, I've done that too, okay? We've all done that one time or other. I had a friend. We used to play golf together a lot, and uh, we'd finish playing, and he said, Roger, here comes the little, you know, the little ball boys and the bag boys and the cart guys, and, and uh, he said to me, listen, and he used the term little people, not derogatory, but I understand. He said, listen, always give a nice tip to the little people. He said, remember, you were once there yourself. Well, that's useful. So be generous is what he's saying. But now the real Greek term behind this is be useful. Love is useful. Uh, Gordon and Gail uh, uh, McDonald got on an airplane to make a trip. They were seated near the back. As the plane was loading, a woman comes down the uh, aisle with two children, a woman right behind her. Uh, one of the women sits by the uh, window in the C, excuse me, in the A seat, and the other woman sits in the C seat by the aisle, and they put one of the children in the seat between them, and the uh, mom on the aisle is going to hold the baby. And it was obvious that here are two mothers bringing their children on the plane. And, and what's, what's he and his wife praying? Oh, God, let them shut up during this flight. You know what I mean? Just don't let them ruin this flight. Well, the flight was turbulent. Children are children. 
they uh, had their ears bursting, you know, as the plane ended. And what, what happened was the uh, two women began to comfort these children. The woman by the window <coughs> was leaning over to the child in the middle seat, trying to engage them and make them a little happier. And uh, Gordon McDonald said, I was thinking these women should have gotten a medal for how they were doing so well. But at that point, they're nearing the time to land and everything fell apart. And a little child in the middle seat begins throwing up from the bottom of the resources of whatever's down in there. And it's all over the seat, all over the one by the window. And then the diaper comes loose and the loose stuff comes out. And here's this poor lady by the window. She's got vomit all over her, diarrhea all over her, ruins her dress. She's got it on her arms, a little bit on her face. And she's leaning over trying to take care of this child. Trying to comfort this child. And, and finally the plane comes to a stop and the passengers with the stench in the plane are trying to get out of there as fast as they can. And the, the flight attendant finally makes it over there with some, some napkins, paper towels. And the flight attendant turns to the woman by the window and says, Here, here are some uh, things to help take care of your child. And the woman by the window says, that's not my child. See, that's being useful. It's being kind. We can all do that. Is there a better picture of love than the woman by the window? Love is patient. Love is kind. Okay, next. Love rejoices with the truth. And I tried to put these in some contemporary terms for simple explanations. And what I think this means is love catches people doing right and makes a big deal out of it. Uh, John Blanchard wrote the book, The One-Minute Manager. A lot of us have read that book. How many of you read The One-Minute Manager? It's a great book. Half of us plus. And in there, remember, he talks about the one-minute praising. You catch somebody doing good, and you take a minute and just praise them. And, and I, I think sometimes, uh, you know, there's some of us, we can talk 60 minutes about somebody's shortcomings. And have a trouble filling up 60 seconds, you know, of their good stuff. And what he's saying is you practice this. Uh, John Wooten, legendary coach at UCLA. How many of you know John Wooten? All right. It was March Madness last week. How many of you all enjoyed watching March Madness the last several weeks? Okay, good. Thank you, guys. A few ladies. How many of you wives or girlfriends enjoyed sitting forced on the couch while he watched, you know, and maybe if that was your situation, you heard the term assist. An assist is when one player has the ball and they pass it to another player who takes only one step or less and that player makes a basket. And an assist is a big deal. They kept track of those. Now here's John Wooten, if you've read his biography, won uh, 10 national titles. He, uh, as you read his biography, realized he was building character and values into these players that transcended so much. And he, he was a tremendous coach. And one of the principles he had was this. The incoming freshman would come in and he'd say, here's what you do. If you've got the ball and you pass to a, a partner there, one step or less, he makes a basket, you get the assist. But if you're the one that has the ball passed to you and you make the basket, then you turn around and point at the one who gave you the assist and wink. Thank you. And one of the freshmen asked, yeah, but what if he's not looking? And John Wooten said, don't worry, he'll be looking. <laughs> Love finds the good and makes a big deal of it. Love always protects. Now you can put that in terms of it shelters folks from the storms of life like protection. So I put that in there. But what this really means is, uh, love protects re b uh, reputations, all right? It stops gossip. It doesn't gossip. It's looking to protect relationships. Like uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter f uh, 2, verse 4, love covers over a multitude of sins. I uh, used to have a lot of terrible acne when I was a teenager. It was awful. Some of you have gone through that. And, you know, you wash your face with Clearasil and you do all this stuff and take all these. It doesn't help much because, you know, it's not a washing your face kind of deal. It's a chemical reaction going on that 
uh, produces this, and hopefully, and you know, we all grow out of it eventually, but I really struggle with this. And one day I was sitting in seventh grade class in English, Mrs. Coleman's class, and the uh, Texas history teacher, Mrs. Horn, came into the classroom, and Mrs. Coleman and Mrs. Horn talked for a while, and then Mrs. Horn made her way kind of around to the back of the room, and she's standing a few desks behind me, and she says, um, do you think Roger doesn't wash his face enough? Well, boy, that got my attention. I'm starting to turn beet red. You know, probably, says Mrs. Horn, if he, if he just washes his face more often, now she's trying to talk to me, see, you know, if he just washes his face more often, he could solve this problem and not have it anymore. Can you imagine that was embarrassing? I was totally humiliated, and I was thinking, you know, what in the world is she doing in this classroom anyway? You know, she's in the wrong class. She ought to get out of here. But that didn't help. She made fun of my acne, tried to speak to me through the kids. It was totally humiliating. Now, you know, that was uh, over 40 years ago. And I've never, it burns as much when I think of it now as it did 40 years ago. Now, I've forgiven the old hag, see. <laughs> but I'll tell you what happened right after that. Class dismisses. And my friend Zach Miller walks over. He says to me, Roger... Roger, it's okay. It won't be like this forever. Isn't it nice to have friends like that? Love always trusts. Now, what does that mean in Greek? Well, here's what it means. It's a simple thing. It always trusts. Love is quick to give others the benefit of the doubt, not to slop. Uh, when I came out here to pastor... Um, I was 25, and uh, my mentor there in, uh, in Dallas said to me, now remember, when you cross the state line, you forever forget you're a Texan. People get sick of hearing about Texas. You become an Arizonan as soon as you cross the line. You know, that was really good advice. I considered that really my adult life. Then he also says, and just remember when you're pastoring, there will always be people who are willing to give you the benefit of the slop. Whoa, I thought he was going to say doubt. Now, isn't that true? There are people who are always willing to give us the benefit of the slop. Love believes in people. Think about Jesus and the guys he picked. Would you have picked Peter? You know, he's always saying the wrong thing, puts his foot in his mouth. Deserts Christ. Would you pick Peter? How about James and John? The sons of thunder. Call down fire on that city, God. You know, you want to be around guys like that? They were proud. They brought their mother into the middle of the group. The others were obviously uh, sinful, but we just don't know about all their sin. And we wouldn't have, uh, have wondered one bit if Jesus had scratched his head and uh, said, Father, I don't know how to tell you this, but this stuff isn't going to work. Have you seen these guys we've picked? Now, I'm willing to, you know, die and go on the cross and go back to heaven if you want to, but maybe we ought to consider that we ought to start this deal over with because I don't think they're going to make it. No. I trust these guys. I know they've got them in it, got it in them. I know they can do it. And they did. See, love is the kind of thing that trusts. One of my uh, friends growing up in... Uh, School, played a lot of basketball together. His name's Stacy. Uh, he was a tremendous athlete. I remember that. And I also remember that uh, his reputation with girls as a womanizer was legend. Only probably would you just say in high school a girlanizer, whatever that would be. I remember the day that we were getting ready for practice and he's messing around behind the bleachers. He's got this girl's nylon stocking on top of his head, kind of like a Santa cap. And he's messing around back there and the coach comes and looks and the look on the coach's face was just... You know, utter shock. He knew how to throw a party. When uh, one of my friends was getting married after we all got out of college, um, we were in another city, and I was one of the groomsmen, and Stacy was too. And I remember he pulls up in the parking lot, throws open the door, and says, Guys, I got the beer. There was a couple of cases back there in the back seat. And I got the porno film. 
And you know, I didn't really enjoy being around Stacy all that much then. He was going on one path, I was going on another. And you can imagine the total shock when about 10 years later, one of my friends, Farrell, calls and says, have you heard about uh, Stacy? No. Um, he, he's working in children's church now. <laughs> going, what? Yeah. He was led to Christ. And he's, he's working in children's church. You know, there are people who could come along and say, you know, I see something inside of him. There's a lot of good down in there. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and led the guy to Christ. Love gives people the benefit of the doubt, not the slop. This is really relevant in, uh, in cyberbullying now. It's really easy to really demolish somebody's reputation on the Internet. In fact, there's evidences now of bullies who've written stuff and people who committed suicide because of what others said about them on the Internet. And it's really important to watch this. I had an adult friend who had to uh, leave his city quickly, got a job issue, and he had to depart, left some of his church friends behind without saying goodbye. And one of the church friends didn't like it, and so they posted a derogatory comment on this guy who had to leave town on the Internet, and then he unfriended him. Can you imagine the pain of being unfriended? I want to say how many of you have been unfriended, but I'm not going to ask that question. It's an awful thing. And so this guy who did the bad post enlisted 15 other people in their Bible study groups, some other things, and they all unfriended him. You know, you can hurt a lot of people now on the Internet, but love says, no, I'm not going to do that. It covers a multitude of sins. It believes the best about people. It trusts. And, and look, love always hopes. As long as the grace of God is operative, human Failure is never final. We make a mistake. God bails us out. Other folks have given up hope on us. Thank God there's a God in heaven who never gives up his hope for us. Uh, Bob Erler was known as the catch me killer. He uh, was a police officer in Florida who would stop women on the side of the road and rape them and brutalize them and beat them and had done about 13 or 14 of these. And after each one, he wrote a note and sent it to the cops that said, catch me if you can. And he's a cop. Talk about some psychological issues. He's perpetrating these crimes as a police officer. And he writes these notes, catch me if you can. He was known as the catch me as you can killer. And they finally caught him. Sent him away to prison. And I don't know all the details. I've talked with Bob about this a bit. Um, because of his behavior and his actions and circumstances, they began to uh, give him a number of freedoms. This became quite interesting to me when I went to uh, Florence to preach. I used to go to Florence a lot to prison. It's a spooky thing to go to the prison when you don't have to be there. You know, there are the gates. They open the gates. You walk in the gate. It's all bars. And there's bars in front of you. And they close the back gate. And now you're in this little room with all the gates closed and the bars in place. And you realize, you know, I'm at their mercy. <laughs> I can't get out of here unless they let me. And you walk across the commons, and they have a, a room set apart where the Christians can get early and have a little service, and others can come. And I used to preach. And one, one evening I was preaching, and after the service, uh, uh, one of the Native Americans came to me and said, you know, uh, you know how I became a Christian? I said, no. He said, I've been in this prison, uh, prisons, 20, 27 of my 49 years of life. And I, I'm not going to get out for a long time. But, you know, I thank God, he said. And we were playing ball one day, and it was a hot day, and this guy brings me a cup of water. And I drink the water, and afterwards we sit down, and he leads me to Christ. He says, I'm a Christian, proud of it. And he said, you know, that guy was Bob Erler. And who would have guessed? See, as long as God's grace operates, human failure, says love, is never final. Love always perseveres. No matter how hopeless the battle, how fierce the struggle is the Greek word. Love hangs in. It never turns tail and runs. It always perseveres. So you take your wedding vows. I promise to love, honor, cherish, death do us part. In good times, bad times. 
So I'm dealing with Tom and Mary. Names are changed. They're probably in the book here somewhere. I don't know. But um, they're Christians, and they, they just don't get along very well. And, and they want to get a divorce to kind of start over, but they want to be sure God's not mad at them. And so they're sitting in my office, and Mary says, you know, Pastor, and she gives all the sordid details, but they're, they're friends, you know, they just went out of this marriage. And she says, so you see, there's just no hope, there's no foundation we could build on, there's just no love, you know, we really ought to get this divorce. Tom, he talks about all of his problems and the issues in the marriage, and then he says, so you see, Pastor, there's no hope. There's no foundation for a marriage. There's no love. And what they wanted me to say was, you know, you're right. I mean, you know, it's just obvious you all are going different directions. And it's obvious to me there's no love. There's not much hope. Not much foundation for the future. And I looked at him and paused and said, so what that means is you just have to learn to love each other. That was not what they wanted to hear. So I turned to Tom and I said, okay, Tom, let's talk about this. Uh, Ephesians 5 says that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Could you love her like Christ loved the church? He goes, uh-uh, can't do that. Well, let's go down a level. The Bible says, love your neighbor. You know, she's probably your closest neighbor. Y'all live in the same house still. Could you love her as your neighbor? No, don't want to do that. Well, then let's go down one more step. Jesus said, love your enemy. Could you love her as your enemy? See, it's real easy to let go of divine agape love and forget the fact that God can pour in the power in any relationship, and he can pour in the power and, and make love something that lasts forever. It never fails. See, if it gets to that point where it seems to be sliding, he just kind of sums it up. Love never fails. It's a Greek word that talks about a flower that kind of withers away. It's the Greek word that describes a play and the actor on the play, and he's so bad that he gets hissed off the stage. And what this word says is in a relationship, uh, love should never, true love never gets hissed off the stage. It perseveres. 